I thank you, Brother Young, and good morning, friends and brethren in the television audience. Presently, we want to continue our study. This, I believe, and let me tell you why. First, I'd like to make known that I've been preaching for the Lord's Church in Egypt for nearly five years. And those of you who live in that community, we'd like to invite you to come and assemble with us when we meet for worship. We meet each Lord's Day morning at 9 for Bible studies for all age groups, our morning worship at 10. We meet each Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, each Wednesday night at 7. And we extend to the public a cordial invitation to attend any and all of our assemblies. Our text for our study, this I believe, and let me tell you why, is 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We've already presented two points that I really believe. With my heart, my whole heart, I believe that God is. Overwhelming evidence proves the existence of God. And because of that, I can understand why David said, as recorded in Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the second thing that I believe, which I've already presented, I believe the Bible to be what it claims to be, inspired of God. I only touch the hem of the garment with regard to external and internal evidences in proof of the inspiration of the Bible. But let me tell you something, viewers and listeners to our program. There is evidence beyond measure establishing the truthfulness and authenticity and inspiration of the Bible. It is God's book from Him to you and me. It tells us of our origin, our mission, and our destiny in the world to come. Place your faith in the Bible because it is God's holy, inspired Word. But in addition to those two things we've already discussed, I believe the Bible can be understood. I state this because some well-meaning people have been told that the Bible is a closed book and that it's beyond their ability to understand or comprehend. In all kindness, that's not true. The book of the Bible really is milk for the babe. Now, there are figurative passages, apocalyptic passages that are rather difficult to understand, but the simple things that we must know, believe, and obey to be saved and to live the Christian life, we can understand those things. Remember Ephesians 5, 17? Listen to Paul. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's a direct statement. You're responsible, and I'm responsible, to come to an understanding of the will of God. I called our attention last week to Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4, and I'd like to do it again for another purpose. Listen to what Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says you can read and understand. I believe him, don't you? Absolutely, we can understand. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. God would not be the God of compassion and love that I've always presented him to be if he has made known the fact that we cannot go to heaven without doing his will, knowing all the while that you and I cannot understand his will. The idea that we cannot understand it is false. When it comes to the fundamentals, well, let me put it this way. There's no reason for us to misunderstand why Jesus died when he established the church. And as we shall see later in our study, what we must do to be born again, to be saved, to become members of the body of the church, how to worship acceptably, how to be organized locally as a local congregation. All these fundamentals are simple. And the responsibilities of living the Christian life, those things are a matter of black and white, meaning faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. It's simply a matter of our opening our hearts and reading and doing what the Bible says. We can understand what to believe. We can understand what to obey. And we can know by obeying the will that we can understand that we're right with God before, because we read in 1 John 2, verse 3, hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. The Bible can be understood. Do not be misled by those who would convey the idea that it's beyond your ability to understand. Now, I'm not saying that we can understand all of the Bible. The very fact that we cannot fathom all the depths of the Bible is proof that 
a being superior than man is its author. And we've already talked about God who created the world and God who is the author of the Bible, having sent the Holy Spirit to reveal and confirm the truth of the Bible. So we have uh, the Bible for the scholar and for the common man. But again, what we have to know to be saved, how to live the Christian life, how to worship, and letting those things stand for other fundamentals, no need to misunderstand those things. We can understand, we can believe and obey, and be right with God. And thanks be to God for the fact that we can understand the Bible. The Bible is something else. There's something else I'd like to say about the Bible. This I believe about the Bible. It is all sufficient. Meaning, we don't need the creeds of men that divide us and that perpetuate division. It is a complete record. I've already shared with you the fact that it's inspired of God. Let me make known to you that it's all sufficient to meet all of our needs. I revert to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 where Paul says in verse 17 that we have the scriptures profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete thoroughly or completely furnished unto all good works. That establishes not only its origin, the inspiration by which the scriptures have been given, but the fact that they're all sufficient to meet all of our needs. At 2 Peter 1 verse 3, According as His divine power hath given or granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who hath called us to glory and virtue. In 2 John 9, we're told not to go beyond the doctrine. In Jude 3, we are told that the faith has once for all been delivered to the saints. We read in James 1, 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man should be blessed in his deeds. We're told in Galatians 1, 8, that the apostles and angels had no right and have no right to preach another gospel. So we have a complete record, an all-sufficient record, to meet all of our needs. That's why we're not to add to it or subtract from it, because we have a complete body of truth. Jesus said during his personal ministry by way of promise to his apostles in John 16, 13, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. Our Lord kept his promise. And on Pentecost of Acts 2, the apostles were baptized with the Spirit. And on that day, the Spirit began his work of revealing and confirming the gospel. Several years passed, and then Peter said, We have received all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The Lord kept his promise. The Holy Spirit came and revealed all truth. The Bible is all sufficient. Away with the creeds of men, the opinions of men that lead people away from the way that's right and cannot be wrong. It has well been said that a creed that contains more than the Bible is objectionable because it does contain more. And a creed that contains less than the Bible is objectionable because it contains less. And a creed of man that differs from the Bible is objectionable because it differs from that which is perfect. We cannot improve upon the faith once delivered to the saints. We cannot improve upon the perfect law of liberty. Thanks be to God that we have his record and that we have the all-sufficient record from him to man. But there's something else. I believe, and let me tell you why. I believe the Bible must be rightly divided or handled aright. If you're listening to me and viewing this program attentively, you realize, or you should, that I'm not giving you what I think. I'm not sharing with you my opinions. I'm giving you divine testimony. I'm giving you divine passages given by the Spirit that show the simplicity of these subjects that we are discussing. Now, what have I just affirmed? I believe the Bible must be rightly divided. Now, to show you that we're responsible to do that, we turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul says, Study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. Viewers of our program, we are responsible to study the Scriptures. We are responsible to rightly divide the word of truth or handle aright the word of truth. Now, has God commanded us to do something we cannot do? I ask, has God enjoined upon us this responsibility of handling aright the word of God or rightly dividing the word of God? Is he telling us to do something we cannot do? Absolutely not. If a person is so disposed, 
if he has an open heart, a good heart that wants to learn, that seeks with an open heart, with an open Bible, he can start with Genesis. He can see how man fell, how God made the promise to Abraham, how the law was added to the promise. When Christ came, took away the law when he died, when Christianity was established, it unfolds beautifully and plainly. He can understand it and he can rightly divide it. Oh, but sometimes people fail to realize that it takes a diligent study to properly handle or rightly divide the word of truth. Now let me share with you some divisions that are so important. As we noticed last week, the Bible contains 66 books. This wonderful volume containing 66 books is made up of a library of books. Take, there are five divisions of the books of the Old Testament, knowing that we have 39 books of the Old Testament. We have books of law, history, poetry, major prophets, and minor prophets. Then we come to the 27 books of the New Testament. We have four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us of the life of Christ. We have the fifth book, Acts of Apostles, telling us of the establishment of the Lord's Church, the beginning of the execution of the Worldwide Commission, and how people were converted to Christ, how they became citizens in the kingdom. We have the epistles of Paul and others, some of which were written to individuals, others written to congregations, telling us how to live the Christian life. And Revelation telling us to be faithful under all circumstances to the end, knowing that if we die in Christ, we can be saved and happy forevermore. It's wonderful to know that all 66 books of the Bible, and we have the library as just acknowledged, all these books revolve around the Christ. The 39 books tell us that someone is coming. Christ is coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us of Christ giving us uh, the testimony and the miracles that he performed to prove his deity, that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah for whom uh, the Jews had been looking. He is the Messiah of Old Testament prophecy. He has fulfilled those prophecies and has proven himself to be the Son of God by signs, miracles, and wonders, and mighty deeds, Acts 2 and verse 22. Then we have Acts telling us how to get into Christ. And we have the epistles telling us how to live in Christ. And we have Revelation encouraging us to overcome, not give up. When we prosper or when we experience adversity, we're more than conquerors with Christ. Be faithful to the end, and you can die in Christ. And Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed or happy are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. When we look at this wonderful book from God, the Bible, we acknowledge three major periods of time, patriarchal, mosaical, or Jewish, and Christian. When man sinned, God demanded that life be sacrificed for sin, and we have embracing 2,500 years the patriarchal period, a family system. There was no written law that God gave to man during this time. God spoke to Abraham, Noah, and others in diverse ways. God did demand that they offer animal sacrifices. And God gave them moral precepts, yes, even during this period of time. Man had fallen, and God began to deal with them in what we might call a starlight age, some light, but gradually giving light. God said to Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham later, in Genesis 12, verse 3, And thy seed all nations will be blessed. 430 years after the promise was made, According to the Galatian letter, the first written law was added to that promise because of sin, Galatians 3.19. It was added to the promise that God gave to Abraham, which promise said, In Abraham's seed all nations would be blessed. Now this law was given to the descendants of Shem, called the Hebrews, the Israelites, later the Jews. When we talk about the Hebrews, Jews, and Israelites, we're talking about the same people, God's chosen people, who received this first written law from God through Moses. Now the Gentiles, who came from Japheth and Ham, did not receive this law. But the Jews were God's chosen people, and this law was given to the Jews as a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. For 1,500 years, this law governed and guided the Jews. It's true that Gentiles could be proselyted into the economy of uh, Judaism. But at first, indeed, 
The law was given to the Jews. Now the promise was all nations would be blessed. The law didn't fulfill that promise. The law was added to the promise until Christ would come. The promise seed, Galatians 3, 16. During this time, the prophets prophesied of the coming of the Christ, and they prophesied of the kingdom, of the coming of the kingdom and the church. Then at the proper time, Christ came into the world. We read in Galatians 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and our Lord, the Savior, was born while the law of Moses was operative. While the law was operative, he prepared the people for his coming death and for the establishment of the kingdom of the church and the proclamation of the gospel in its fullness. He chose 12 apostles according to Matthew chapter 10. And he said during this time in Matthew 16 18, I will build my church as he spoke to Peter and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. During this time he said, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you and he will give you memory to the extent that you can remember what I've taught you John 14, 26. And the Spirit will guide you into new truth, all truth. John 16, 13. John the Baptist prepared the way for the coming of the Lord in fulfillment of Isaiah 40. And then at the right time, our Lord died on the cross. He shed His blood for the sins of the world. He was raised from the dead. And He called His apostles together. And He said, Now go teach all nations. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, that he that believeth not shall be damned. In Luke 24, we have Luke's version of the Worldwide Commission. And the apostles were told by our Lord, tear in the city of Jerusalem, and you'll be endued with power from on high. They went to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was dispatched from heaven. They were fulfilled with the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of Isaiah 2 and Joel 2. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2 verse 16. Peter stood up and preached the first gospel sermon in his fullness and told those people to hear, verse 22. Three thousand souls heard and their hearts were pricked as Peter spoke words by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Three thousand souls received the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, into their hearts. They interrupted his great message, saying, in essence, you've convinced us that we are guilty of sin, that we've crucified the Son of God. You've convinced us that he died for our sins. We believe, in other words, what in the world shall we do? We know he's the Christ. He's proven himself so by signs, miracles, and wonders. Notice the answer in verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Here we have... On Pentecost of Acts 2, in the city of Jerusalem, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the beginning of the gospel in its fullness, the beginning of the Christian age. We must recognize that we're not living during the patriarchal period. We're not living under the law of Moses. Now all men, Jews and Gentiles, live under the gospel. The Bible must be rightly divided. Thank you for viewing our program. Until next Lord's Day, I bid you a pleasant good day.